Hello, I'm Vince Pacenti with part two of our program focusing on the solutions in society surrounding ageism. In part one of our program, we delved into the prevalent issue of ageism and gained some powerful insights. But in this program, we investigate ways we can all be a part of the solutions surrounding that topic. Our guests are Ashton Applewhite, who amplifies the message regarding the damage that ageism is doing in our world today. She's an author of This Chair Rocks, a manifesto against ageism. Check out her TED Talk that was worthy of her standing ovation. We welcome back Louise Aronson, MD, a leading geriatrician, writer, educator, and professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller and Pulitzer Prize finalist, the book Elderhood. Also joining us remotely is Julie Ober Allen, an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma. Her research seeks to better understand and address the complex issues surrounding stress and the coping processes that contribute to the disparities in chronic disease among older U.S. adults. And in the studio we have with us is Michelle Ha, who is an acclaimed HR professional. She brings a fresh perspective on recruitment, development, and retention of top talent no matter what their age. Now, thank you all for bringing your insights to this discussion on ageism and the problems that come with it, and maybe the solutions we can each be a part of. And Ashton, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> what strategies, interventions, and policy changes do you propose for combating ageism? Well, we've been talking um, in the first half of the show about uh, age bias in healthcare, age bias in employment. We know that women face the intersection of ageism and sexism. So, you know, age, because everyone ages, ageism is relevant to every person. We are not going to undo ageism in the workplace or ageism in healthcare without grassroots culture change to reframe the way we think about aging to a more accurate and nuanced perspective, right? So that's why I do what I do, which is to try and inform and spread the word about the global movement to end ageism, which is underway. The World Health Organization launched, for example, a global campaign to combat ageism in 2021. And, you know, not the World Old People Organization, because they realized that that ageism was the biggest threat to a to enjoying um, as healthy being as healthy as possible for as long as possible because everyone is living longer. So join the movement. How do you do that? Well, I want to reference a website called Old School, Old School Anti-Ageism Clearinghouse, oldschool.info, hundreds of free resources, campaign section. There are over 30 campaigns around the world if you want to see how other people are doing it. Latest one launched across the UK just last month. But don't think that you have to, you know, chain yourself to a fence or, you know, eat, eat ageism for breakfast, lunch and dinner like I do. I'll do that for you. Even if you shift your thinking about age a little bit, even if you question, for example, someone says, I'm too old. You mentioned your dad. I'm too old to play. Well, dad, what do you mean by too old? Like, it's never about age. Ask him or ask yourself, what do I really mean when I'm blaming something on age and focus on the underlying issue or emotion and think about why that's tied to age even if even if you just stop to question your own attitudes you will be different in the world and you will carry that out and that is how we make culture change now, louise you're nodding away there what's your uh perspective on <laughs> aging the population retirement the economic stability and the social welfare programs i mean there's a whole cadre of things that we could work on. What's your perspective there? Um, well, I want to start by just, you know, uh, agreeing with Ashton and applauding her incredible work in this area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, there, this is a real opportunity. You know, we keep hearing the negative side of this, the silver tsunami, etc. But the truth is that we've got the largest aging population that this country and actually the planet has seen, and that's an opportunity. We've been talking about how people can work longer. If we own our age and don't internalize that ageism, then we can be the force that changes, that creates the policies and the opportunities. This can be everything from the person speaking up to saying, 
hey, you're redesigning the park and I'd like to see some things there that would that I'd enjoy doing and that would keep me healthier and enable me to socialize um, as you are doing for children and, and adults. Um, there are opportunities everywhere, starting with ourselves, but you also, I mean, this is where the ageism comes in, right? If you're trying to pretend you're not old because society values the young, then you're sort of helping to create the devaluation that's scaring you in the first place. So it really does start with saying, hey, I'm old, and this is one of the four gazillion ways that old looks, and here's what older people can do. So I think starting there and then looking at every policy from the tiny and local to the big and national and asking, are we looking across the entire human lifespan with this policy? Because that improves the health for everyone. I mean, there, there are ways in which child health is much worse than elder health. So you can make a difference for children and expanding policies that do extend to children and adults to elders help everyone age more healthily which delays the point where you need someone like me to come in and help you out. All right, Julie, what advice would someone who hears ageist comments from others and from that reflexive ageist voice within ourselves as well, how do we combat that uh, narrative that seems to be outwardly going, inwardly going out? I mean, in many ways, it's very challenging. Um, ageism, maybe the most prevalent form of discrimination in the United States. Over 93% of US adults ages 50 and over report that they regularly experience sort of routine forms of ageism. So it's incredibly, it's incredibly prevalent, but yet it's also often um, a joke. You know, we all see the birthday cards when we go into the pharmacy making jokes about aging. Um, people make sort of those self-deprecating comments about, oh, I'm having a senior moment or referencing, you know, the wrinkles or the gray hair. It's really hard to, when you experience ageism, to sort of um, speak out and be taken seriously because it is so socially condoned and prevalent. It's so ingrained in our society. I mean, even um, studies have found that even preschool aged children, so that's, you know, two and three year olds, recognize older adults as a separate category of people and are not only aware of sort of stereotypes and prejudices, but enact them. And so it's ageism is deeply ingrained in our society and it's really difficult to sort of speak up and say, hey, I have a problem with something you've said, um, particularly when you're interacting with other people or with institutions, when in all likelihood, um, you will be blown off and you won't be taken seriously. And that's, so I think increasing awareness of ageism and its potential harms in terms of to society, in terms of um, very skilled people being forced out of the workforce, in terms of negative health outcomes. We have to raise awareness um, so that we can start recognizing it as a societal problem. That is maybe the theme word of our, our program right now <laughs> is to this awareness begins that path to going, well, what is the solution or the narrative, as you mentioned, uh, just buying into a narrative and sticking with that narrative to our own detriment. So, all right. So in the HR world, uh, what pivots are companies making right now in the world of ageism and what kind of pivots are you noticing? So like in any kind of cultural shift that we see in the workplace, whether, you know, the Me Too movement or, um, you know, just awareness about any societal issue, it really starts with education. And as everybody else has mentioned, awareness really starts there. And so we are seeing more companies doing training around unconscious bias and bringing um, even training and education around um, you know, differences around different generations and just driving uh, that awareness. But beyond that, we are seeing organizations that are being very intentional with their diversity and inclusion efforts, where they are investing in software that will um, take off some of the demographic data that might contribute to discriminatory hiring practices, we are also seeing um, organizations that are doing more to provide collaborative 
uh, work environments where individuals that are more senior have opportunities to be mentors and vice versa. There's reverse mentorship where individuals that are at the younger end of the spectrum can help mentor their more senior counterparts in things that might not be as uh, familiar to them um, around some of the digital media and some of the um, you know technology tools that maybe they didn't grow up with. All right, so what are we all noticing, and this is a question for the group, in terms of movies and uh, popular screen time, if you will, are we noticing a shift? Is How far along are we? Um, Ashton, you want to jump in on that? Sure. Um, you know, I think we are seeing much more attention to older characters in movies. People are starting to point out the absence. I mean, ideally, the, our, our entertainment would reflect the distribution of, of age distribution of the general population. We know that's not the case. We know that women age out earlier and more cruelly if they are entertainments, if they're in the entertainment business. So no judgment on what any person does to keep themselves in the game. It's hard. Where I see um, uh, enormous optimism, although this may strike you as slightly nuts, but there's so much conversation now about the age of presidential candidates and almost all of it across the political spectrum references ageism. That was not the case even a year ago. You, most bias is unconscious and we can't do anything about it until we see it and until we become aware of it. So the fact that it is in all these headlines, I don't think it's making ageism worse. I think it is shining a light on what has been there all along and showing that the culture is ready to engage with these ideas. Well, Lee, Louise, you know, how old is too old to do a job, right? That's a fundamental question. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it depends both on the job and the person. We keep talking about the diversity in old age. So there isn't an age cutoff. One of the things that's different about adulthood and elderhood compared to childhood, absent serious illness um, in childhood, people move pretty predictably through stages. You know, two-year-olds in one country look like two-year-olds in another country. Now, once you get to the teens, it already starts diversifying, right? Because you've got the 16 year old that's, you know, so mature, and then you've got the 26 year old that you're hoping will get out of adolescence one day, right? So that just becomes more so. Uh, you know, we've already seen things like pilots having certain restrictions. I think it's, it's an interesting conversation now. People are saying, uh, for instance, with driving, you can't drive until you pass a certain test and you need to be 16. Um, and there's something that comes before that. Do we get something at the other end of the, of the lifespan? And I would argue that there isn't really a cutoff that's helpful there. It's about function. So to me, the best approach is for every job, you know, or responsibility, you come up with some core attributes and people regardless of age, young, old, in between need to show competence in those attributes. And so it's not about age, it's about the ability to do the job um, and whether it's present or absent. That's the fair way of doing it to my mind. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk a bit about, uh, you see resumes come in, you see people applying for jobs and uh, I can imagine they're not putting the dates on there in fears that they will be uh, the victim of ageism. What are you noticing? Well, overall in recruitment, the game has changed in not just older individuals, but anyone is doing more of job around storytelling and where are they going to add value. Um, and that's really what recruiters want to see. They don't necessarily want to see three pages of fine print with every single detail listed. Um, and so anyone that is looking for a job, especially if they're um, you know, on the older side of the spectrum, really needs to focus on what value are they going to bring the organization and how are they gonna make a difference? Um, that is gonna be much more powerful than listing um, duties or tasks on a resume. So I encourage um, anyone doing a job search to really tell a story. And I think that that can really um, be very impactful with getting attention and getting those interviews. All right. Well, telling a story and making sure that awareness, we've got that theme going as well here, and making sure that we have that awareness in the story we're telling is um, 
serving us and not holding us back, right? Those attributes that, Louise, you mentioned. Julie, there's some negative stereotypes that abound with aging. What advice would you give a younger viewer? Ah, that's a great uh, question. Um, I think probably, well, the encouragement that I would give a younger viewer is to um, have a diverse social network. What we found is that one of the most effective strategies for breaking stereo breaking down stereotypes of, of any kind, whether it's related to race or gender or age, is having more inter, you know, having more diverse relationships. So, for example, with age, we find that inter people who have more intergenerational relationships, they know more people of a variety of different ages, are much less likely to get sort of stuck on these very narrow stereotypes that really don't reflect the diversity within um, any age range. So those that have more individualized relationships, they start to recognize people for, for their unique characteristics. Um, and then oftentimes those stereotypes, they, they just don't seem to fit anymore. The more people you know, the more you realize that those stereotypes just really don't fit any group of people. Um, so that's one of the strategies that we recommend. Certainly the workforce um, has been identified as one of those very intergenerational, inter-age uh, uh, contexts. And so keeping older adults, um, giving them more opportunities to remain in the workforce should they choose to do that, rather than sort of separating. And we have this tendency, particularly in the United States, to push older adults into older living communities or into nursing homes or um, into you know senior service activity centers rather than um, keeping them actively involved and giving them more opportunities to remain in these sort of mixed age um, contexts. Ashton. One little, it's, it's, it's a small act, it's not, not easy, but way to bust out of these age silos because the, the biggest threat to a good old age is social isolation. It's not wealth, it's not health, it's, it's whether you have a big social network. Obviously, it's good for older people to have younger friends and vice versa, but we live in a very age-segregated society and ageism sanctions that, right? It excuses discrimination and isolation. It legitimizes those things. So one thing you can do, and I say this to myself as well, is break the habit, we all have it, of making a beeline for people our own age. When we show up at a party, when we get to a meeting, managers have a role to play here too, Michelle. I'm sure you know by mixing it up in the office and making sure that you know workers of all ages mix. Because the minute you have you know colleagues or friends who are not like you in some fundamental uh, aspect, it's really hard. It gets a lot harder to hold on to stereotypes about that aspect of their identity. Louise. Well, I was just thinking. So uh, I teach in San Francisco, and it's an incredibly diverse student body. And they think about diversity, equity, and inclusion all the time. And so sometimes showing that with, within that wonderful inclusive framework, there is something missing. And the same things you know that, that they're upset about are happening about age. And it's usually not ill intent, it's a lack of awareness. Um, so, so really pointing out, look, this is how it looks when you're dealing with um, LGBTQ people, and this is how it looks when you're dealing with BIPOC people, and this is how it looks when you're dealing with very old or very young people. Um, I find that not assuming the worst uh, helps a lot, and sometimes people don't realize what they're doing to themselves and other people. They'll say, oh, but I love my grandmother. And so how, how is this helping um, with that situation? So really just showing the analogies makes a big difference. Um, we talked about the presidents uh, earlier on and some younger people are saying, look, they should just get out of the way. Uh, and, and that's othering. And most younger people know really well about othering what it feels like and don't necessarily mean to be doing it. Um, so again, just raising awareness, making analogies uh, goes a long way, I find. Well, Julie, there's a lot of examples on how we can go from that awareness to being proactive. Uh, one thing, I have a colleague that they invite young, they're empty nesters, and they invite young people over on a frequent basis, uh, friends of their kids, 
uh, so that they're proactively, and it goes both ways. The younger person is actually hanging out with an older person and they're really enjoying that conversation. Uh, can you think of other examples of things that we could do um, going, like as Ashton says, going straight over to somebody that's not in your age group at a party? What other examples can you think of? I mean, other pieces of it are sort of monitoring yourself because we were all you know, enculturated in a society where ageism is prevalent. It's sometimes, you know, I could make that little comment about why I forgot something, or I could, you know, make a joke about my age. And, you know, the fact that we all periodically have those thoughts, you know, that's based on sort of where we were raised, but we don't need to articulate them. So to a certain extent, there is sort of that self-monitoring because, you know, once we express that it's that it's okay to be ageist then it frankly encourages it and it it reinforces that it is socially acceptable so i think in our interactions you know the more particularly those of us who are thinking a little bit of more the, more about these topics or a little bit more aware of ageism and and concerned about it you know really thinking through even our own communications um when we're interacting with other uh, other individuals with all the other isms, you know, sexism or, you know, racism, you start, we, I can speak for myself. I go, oh, wait, that's, that is a thing that, that is something I need to pay attention to. So we're all on our journey here. And, uh, and I, t I guess in terms of Louise, in terms of policy changes uh, for children or adults, <clears throat> we need to include elders and elderhood. Are we making ground with this rallying cry? We're definitely making progress. I mean, it's actually interesting if you look at the media just in the 21st century, the numbers of mentions um, of older people have gone way up. Um, it, you know, it used to be I would find something of interest maybe once a month and then it was once a week and now you can't even keep up. Uh, part of that uh, is probably the nature of the boomers. Um, I was on a show with one, uh, uh, somebody who's an, a boomer older than I am, I'm at the tail. Um, and he said, you know, I used to think we were all about youth. And then he said, it turns out we're just all about ourselves and now we're old, um, which I thought was hysterical um, and, and might actually be true. So I do think we're seeing transformation. Um, and, and it changes depending on how many people are experiencing something. Uh, sometimes that's for better and sometimes that's for worse. Sometimes when the group is large, other people feel more threatened. Uh, but there's also sort of safety in numbers for people to speak up. What I'd love to see is uh, members of Congress, for example, you get the Black Caucus or you know the, the women's group. Um, I, I'd love to see a group of older people, you know, sort of owning that they are older and that that is a group you can belong to and advocate for, um, which is maybe a little opposite of what we're seeing and could play into the gerontocracy things, but. But I do think it has to be seen as overlapping with other categories and worthy of advocacy. Gerontocracy, that's a new one. <laughs> that's new to me, so thank you. Yeah, no, that, I didn't, that is not my word. Uh, it's been in the media lately about the aging politicians. Uh -huh. um, you know, usually framed in a negative light. Uh, uh -huh. On the other hand, I do think this discussion of aging is really important. And when some people say it doesn't matter at all, I guess I would disagree with that. Uh, we yeah. are different across the lifespan, but we're hugely variably different. So again, it's about skills. Are there some negative things to aging? Absolutely, there are negative things to every life stage. Aging is challenged in that what comes after it is death. Um, so that brings its own uh, difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you know can, anyone you can, you actually can wants the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, right. I don't find anyone who actually wants to go back to their youth. Think about it. No one actually Agreed. wants to wipe the slate clean, no matter how apprehensive we might be, because we know that our years enrich us and make us us. Mm -hmm. But we also need to make the very end part of old age better because right Absolutely. now there's a, there's a lot of emphasis on the sort of functional part of old age, what some people have called the third age, um, which is when you're older, but, but still able to do all the things you like, maybe sometimes differently. And then there's the fourth age, which is the period of debility. And that's the one everyone dreads, sometimes for very good reasons. 
So one of the things I would also encourage is don't lift up old age by pushing the fourth age people away because the vast majority of us will end up there. How can we lift up all parts of old age, including the very end, where sometimes people do wish they were dead? And I sure would like to live in a society where nobody feels that way. Uh, let's talk a bit about unconscious bias. Yes. Because we're obviously trying to transition from unconscious bias to realizing there's a bias, the awareness to the solutions. Are there qu quick fixes you're seeing in the workplace in terms of an unconscious bias around ageism? So again, I in, in any time there's a culture shift, I don't necessarily think there's quick fixes, but I do think having consistent messaging and, and not just doing training once and then putting it on the shelf um, is going to work, but having continual conversations, education, awareness, when you start doing and saying things, over and over, those intentions turn to action. And mm -hmm. that's really where powerful change can happen. But when we talk about unconscious bias, it's not just the older individuals, you know, stereotyping um, the younger, stereotyping the older, it's reverse. And we talked about building relationships and older individuals cannot expect to build meaningful relationships when they're making comments that are very stereotypical about the Gen Zers, you know, that they're high maintenance or they're soft or, you know, you should have been around when we were in the workforce. And that doesn't we, help. we see that no. and we hear that <laughs> a lot. And I know I probably have said it before. I've got um, kids that are in their 20s and, you know, I've sort of, um, you know, lectured them on, mm -hmm. you know, the do's and don'ts of the workplace. But that awareness has to be at all ages and all um, areas of the spectrum. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you all. Uh, this is a very rich conversation. And in terms of ageism, in terms of awareness, in terms of the narrative, and in terms of being part of the solution is hopefully where we're all headed here. So, well, thank you so much for joining us today. We trust that the different perspectives you've heard today will give you more clarity regarding the news on this issue as it passes by us daily. As always, we continue talking about things that matter with people who care, thanks to viewers like you. <laughs>